All right, how are we doing, everybody? Um, so this is my uh, self-reflective uh, response. Uh, we're going to start off with question number one. To what extent do you believe all children and youth learn successfully when informed and caring educators assist them in making sufficient resources available to them? How do you demonstrate your beliefs? Uh, me, personally, I believe this is extremely important. Um, uh, to be able to have a, a teacher and educator uh, there for, uh, for the students, um, I feel like it's, it's vital uh, to their success. Um, me, personally, I like to do, uh, you know, asking questions, you know, going to hallways, ask, asking students how their day is going, um, because that really does make a difference. Uh, also, um, you know, just one-on-one -on -one tutoring when kids need it, I'll stay after school and, uh, and, and help them with anything that they need um, regarding school. Um, also, uh, also in the classroom, I do guided notes as well. Just guys, just goes to show the kids that uh, that uh, instead of just sitting there taking notes, you know, being bored, I guess, guided notes to help them uh, with uh, with learning. Um, along with that, online websites regarding uh, you know help with the, the, the Spanish language like Quizlet. Um, these are all different tools that uh, us as educators and us, us as Spanish teachers we utilize um, to help kids out. So I feel like. You know, if you if you show them that you care, they're gonna care about you and they're gonna care about your class. So I feel like this is very very important. Um, question number two: uh, To what extent do you ensure students are well educated and successful learners? Be specific. Um, so in my class, uh, I feel like uh, especially with language, um, I uh, I like to make a lot of connections to uh, to the real world and to, to life. Um, if I if we include uh, you know lessons regarding maybe music or maybe uh, for example uh, grammar reflexes in Spanish, uh, it connects them to maybe what they did in the morning and stuff like that. So it'll interest them to talk about it while utilizing the grammar. Um, I also like to do uh, you know formative and summative assessments. So just formative assessments, asking kids um, in the classroom, you know, having them raise their hands and, and asking them questions and more of a uh, student directed um, that lets me know uh, if students uh, understand the material and, uh, and, and if students um, you know are well prepared for for the future topics it lets me know that they uh, that they have learned the material and they are successful learners um, and obviously some of the assessments you know uh, assessing them you know completely as a whole whether it's a project whether it's a, it's a test uh, whether it's a quiz speaking um, whatever it may be um, but uh, but yeah, just do those things to uh, to help them and make sure that they they are well educated and well prepared. So moving on to number three, uh, to what extent you create both an educational environment and learning experiences for students that honor and respect who they are. So here in Twinsburg, um, we uh, we kind of started this uh, this thing um, called Tiger Strong, um, and I feel like this is extremely important. Um, and strong is an acronym um, that we utilize, and uh, I'll basically go over them real quick. Uh, the S stands for uh, safe, and it basically talks about having a safe learning environment um, for the students. Uh, you know, this means no bullying, no no teasing each other when we're working together in groups, helping each other out, um, because kids want a, a comfortable, safe learning environment, and that's something that 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 I personally believe is very important. Uh, the T stands for uh, uh, being a team player. Okay, I, I always think about this as in sports, team players. Um, you know, in a basketball team, you need five players uh, to work successfully as a team to be able to, you know, maybe win the game. Well, the same rule applies in, in the classroom. You need all students to work together um, to to you know accomplish a goal and reach a common goal. And uh, I feel like you know if, if one student knows something and another student doesn't, if that student that knows the, the material can help the other student, um, you know that that's just being a team player and helping others out. Um, R is being respectful. Uh, again, you know, not making fun of others. Uh, if someone, if I call on someone to volunteer or uh, or, or speak or, or, or speak in Spanish, um, others are respectful of the, their attempt because you know we all are, we all are shy in regards to communicating and, and speaking. So just being respectful um, amongst each other. Uh, o is organized. Um, being organized is extremely important. Uh, you know, making sure that all, all their you know work is on, on time and, and, and everything's organized and on task. Uh, binders are, are are you know divided up. You no, know, and, and everything like that. Um, and noble is basically being nice. Uh, being you know kind of ties in with respectful. 
Um, and then G, goal-oriented. Um, you know, goal-oriented kids, you know, all, and my, my goal as a teacher is to make sure all kids do well and succeed and, and accomplish maybe getting an A. Um, that's my goal every year, and, uh, and kids need to, you know, be goal-oriented too. So um, that's something that, uh, that we do here uh, and, and make sure, um, you know, we, we implement that as best we can. Uh, to what extent do you ask yourself uncomfortable questions about racism, cultural preferences, and insufficient learning conditions and resources that are obstacles to learning for many students? Um, I ask this, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I don't really, you know, like to talk about it too much, um, obviously, because uh, it's, it's, you know, race is something a little, you know, iffy to talk about, um, racism and, and cultural preferences um, and whatnot. Uh, so I don't really talk about it that much. Um, you know, with others, sometimes I'll ask myself uh, questions, but uh, but it's it's rare, rare and few. Um, so uh, so I, I if I do ask myself, it'll probably be you know at home by myself or whatnot. Um, but but there are times where I do ask myself that, especially you know being from Puerto Rico and uh, experiencing um, you know being oppressed growing up and stuff like that. Um, so I do I do mention it sometimes to myself, which kind of ties in with number five. To what extent do you ask questions about racism, cultural preferences, and insufficient learning conditions and resources that are obstacles for others in your district and school? Again, um, I don't, you know, talk about it, you know, with others that much um, due to fear of what others may think or what others may say. Um, it's not really a topic that that many people, uh, especially depending on who you are, are comfortable in talking about. Um, I'll talk about it by myself, I guess. Um, but uh, it's something that uh, that I don't really. Uh, um, you know, talk about that much. Uh, to uh, to what extent do you engage in practices and policies that align with the belief that all students benefit from educational practices that engage them in learning about their cultural heritage and understand their cultural background? Um, I believe uh, uh, I believe you know I engage in it a lot. Uh, in, in my opinion, you know, and, and by engaging in dialogue is, is something very important. Having conversations. Um, with students, um, you know, in between every bell, I, I, I stand outside and, um, you know, I say hello to students, I talk to students, um, I see what's going on, and I feel like that right there, again, with, uh, with, with ties in with, with number one, I feel like students care, um, you know, in the classroom, you know, I try and come up with, you know, creative lessons and try and get them, you know, uh, you know, excited about learning, learning Spanish and, and whatnot. Um, I'm very high energetic, high energy, um, and uh, I like to I like to talk about culture, especially with Spanish. Um, you know, we talk about different cultures, and we talk about how people in different you know countries uh, do things and norms and differences and and whatnot. So um, a lot of a lot of students like to see you know where I come from and, and what are my beliefs, and so I share that with them, and uh, you know they, they can kind of form form their own opinions about about their own personal beliefs. Um, so that's kind of kind of something neat that we do here, especially with the with the foreign language in Spanish. Um, so we are at uh, number seven. To what extent do you engage in facilitating dialogue regarding the influence of cultural understanding and historic distrust that can result in cultural discomfort and disagreements? Um, again, this goes back to number four and five. I don't really talk about it that much um, due to the fact of that fear of uh, discrimination, uh, d discomfort, sorry, and disagreements. Um, you know, some people may think one not one way, other people might might think others. And uh, you know I don't want to start up uh, a, a, a controversy, I guess, especially being a a, a new teacher uh, for the most part. Um, so, um, but I, I do feel like it's important to engage um, in uh, in dialogue in, in in the time. So uh, I feel like with conversations that are, that we're gonna do here pretty soon, I feel like you know people are gonna open up, um, and that's gonna be great. Um, but again. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't really engage in, in much. Uh, think about your own assumptions and stereotypes about people from cultures other than yours or about students whose living situations may be different from yours. How do assumptions and stereotypes block you from responding thoughtfully and respectfully towards others? This is, this question hit home uh, to me a lot um, because, uh, you know, growing up and coming to school, um, you know, sometimes I would have a rough, rough time at home. Uh, you know, battling with family issues, uh, you know, being, my dad being sick and stuff like that. So sometimes when I would come to school, I would come, uh, you know, out of focus. I wasn't well prepared. I wasn't, I was just in another world. And, and sometimes teachers, you know, assumed that, uh, that uh, I just didn't care. Um, and, uh, and I just, I didn't care about the class. And 
and that wasn't so. I'm a person that likes to that likes school and likes to learn and stuff like that. So I now that I'm a teacher now now that I'm on the other side of the fence, um, I I always take into consideration what may be going on at home um, because uh, because you just never know the home life uh, can can really affect a student's uh, you know uh, attitude about school. For example, um, if, if if a student's parents don't really care about education, then then the, the students, you know, may not, you know, care about education. So therefore, that will affect, um, you know, the, the, the academic achievement. Um, so I try uh, not to have assumptions and stereotypes. Um, you know, some people may, may have, you know, tough home lives, may not have food to eat, um, may, may be going through a really tough, tough time, um, may, may be in a financial crisis. So... I just uh, I try I, I try really hard to you know, black black that black that from uh, responding thoughtfully uh, and respectfully towards others. I treat everybody the same, no matter where if you're if you're black, white, Asian, Indian, um, you know I treat everybody the same. Um, so that's that's something that I really you know pride myself on. Question number nine: um, To what extent do you engage in the implementation of educational practices and policies that improve instructional practices that effectively serve all students? Um, uh, I do again. Uh, I do. I do modeling. I like to model activities sometimes before um, I do something in the class. For example, if I wanted to do a speaking assignment in class, I'll maybe pick a student and have them come up in front and uh, model what I want with that student. So I'll have a conversation in Spanish. You know, go through all the steps, and then students can really see what what's expected out of them um, and and whatnot. Also. Um, chunking, chunking material, chunking information and content into small pieces, so that way students can uh, understand, um, you know, everything, you know, at, at, in little bits of uh, uh, of time and pieces. For students that that have uh, specific IEP modifications or or, or 504, um, modifying tests when needed, um, maybe you know, letting them use, you know, maybe a note card for for help for extra extra help. Or um, or just you know modified test making it a little simpler, especially with Spanish being a very tough language to learn. Um, and then I mentioned before just guided notes. Um, that way it'll guide students um, instead of you know having them just write things down. Guided notes. Uh, that way they can you know utilize that at home and and, and read and review and study. Um, so uh, so those are some of the uh, educational practices that I uh, that I that I utilize uh, in the classroom. Um, so, so that's that. Number 10, to what extent did you engage in posing questions, collecting data, analyzing data, proposing research-based solutions, facilitating action plans for information integrated into the larger school structure, system to provoke changes to policies, procedures, and practices to prom promote equity for all children? Um, you know, something that I, I didn't really think about before I started this class, but now that I, I'm aware of what equity means and something, uh, I'm hoping in the future to be able to, you know, spark up those conversations as of now. Um, I don't really talk about it that much. I only talk about it with a select few uh, teachers that, you know, you know that, I, that, I, that I talk to. Um, the reason I don't talk about it is because of a fear of changing things. Um, you know, if there are methods already in place and teachers are already comfortable with those methods, um, you know, the fear of me coming, you know, being, being a young teacher, you know, coming in and, and trying to implement new things and changes, some people might take offense to that. And, and, and so, um, you know, I fear that. Um, uh, so that's kind of, you know, something that, uh, that, uh, that I do. Again, you know, there are some questions here that, I, that, I, that I'm afraid um, to speak with others, but uh, I know that this class is going to help me break that fear and, and have those conversations. Um, to what extent do you use dis desegregated uh, data to understand more precisely the achievement status of all students and use specific information to identify and implement effective instructional practices and policies? Um, so this question, you know, I, I do a couple different things. Obviously, formative assessments um, I already talked about. Summative assessments I already talked about. Asking questions and, and, and helping students. Um, one kind of interesting thing that I do that I utilize in class is, uh, is the use of uh, online uh, resource and tool called Kahoot. Which is uh, uh, you know they can students can use their phones um, and to answer questions and, and get them thinking at a higher level and the cool thing about that is is that uh, um, once each question gets answered by the students using their mobile device um, it, it'll quickly at, uh, assess the data and it'll let me know okay which student or who got number one 
correct. Um, who, who chose A, who chose B, who chose C, and who chose D? And that way it'll let me know, okay, students are really understanding this information or students really you know, need help on trying to figure out the difference between a certain word or a cer certain topic, a certain grammar point. Um, so it's, it's a, a neat tool that, uh, that I utilize and I like because it, it really helps me you know, get a, a basic understanding of, of who a, a, and, and, and what people need help with what topic. Also, um, SLOs or student learning objectives that, that we utilize, um, we take a we have students take a pretest, um, and um, and then at the end of the year, you know, we take a post test to see, you know, to measure their student growth and whatnot. But something that I also like to do um, in, in before each chapter is to you know get them to uh, you know maybe ask questions like for example in the vocab, um, I'll give them a new vocab list and uh, they may not know any of the words, but uh, Sometimes I'll, I'll get them to, to write a KWL chart, meaning you know what they know, what they think it means, and um, and then the actual definition of a word. Um, so it's kind of like pre-assessing them, um, and before before anything. Uh, but uh, but yet yeah, all this data helps me, you know, figure out if the students understand this and, and if they don't. Um, and then obviously I, I give them a, a test at the end of, the, you know, of each chapter. Um, Number we are at number twelve. To what extent do you communicate across cultures and among diverse uh, diverse cultural groups about policy and practice to improve student learning? Uh, be specific. Um, you know, I, I in class I have conversations with those groups. Um, you know, I, I try and you know talk to those minority groups especially and just people all, all students in general. Um, for example, if uh, if we're in class and we're having a discussion or a conversation about a certain topic, you know, maybe raising the, you know their hands uh, for answering questions is something that you know might be a minor policy, but it's something that I like to do. You know, instead of shouting out an answer, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to those groups and be like, hey, you know, we, we raise our hands to show a sign of respect um, instead of you know shouting out an answer because you know maybe in the future in the real world when you have a job and you're at a business meeting, you don't want uh, your boss to. To, to, to tell you to, uh, you know, don't shout answers, raise your hands. It's something that you learn in high school. Um, you know, even as simple as that, you know, maybe talking to those, you know, groups about, you know, the difference between right and wrong. You know, uh, how about maybe cheating is incorrect. You don't do it because you're not going to, you're not going to learn anything from cheating um, and, and why it's wrong to do that. Um, you know, talking to these groups, talking to these kids, um, you know, makes me feel like a, like a role model, which is great. Um, I like uh, I like helping these kids out and uh, and talking to them, um, so I, I, I talk to all students too as well, not just a specific uh, you know student uh, or groups. I talk to all students. Um, we are two left. <laughs> Number thirteen. Response to the following: When we teach, uh, write about, and model the exercise of leadership, we inevitably support or challenge people's conceptions of themselves, their roles, and most importantly, their ideas about how social systems make progress on problems. Leadership is a normative concept because implicit in people's notions of leadership are images of a social contract. Imagine the differences in behavior and when people operate with the ideas that leadership means influencing the community to follow a leader's vision versus leadership uh, means influencing the community to face its problems. Leaders mobilize people to face problems and communities make progress on problems because leaders challenge and help them to do so. Ronald Heifetz in 1994. When I first initially read this, this quote, um, I immediately thought of, <laughs> for some reason, LeBron James. Um, LeBron James is considered to be a pretty great leader um, and, uh, and whatnot. But people have the notion that, okay, he's a great leader. We're going to do what he says. We're going to do what he says. What he says goes. And that's not true. Okay, That's not what this quote's saying. This quote's saying that a leader should not be the person that, that everyone says, okay, we're going to do what this person says. No, um, a leader is someone that helps others out for example, LeBron James, he helps other teammates out. He helps other, um, other, other, other teammates with uh, maybe you know things that they struggle with regarding things on the court. Um, you know, if 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 a teammate needs help with a jump shot, he'll help that out. Um, that's what being a leader is, because obviously the common goal is to win a basketball game and maybe win the championship. Um, he needs everyone on the team to be on the same page, and that's basically you know what what a good leader does. Leader influences everybody not just themselves. Um, you know, I think about it as, as teachers, you know, growing up, you know, here at high school, um, you know, my baseball coach, Coach Jones, was a leader. He influenced a lot of people. 
um, at the high school. I, I also, um, the person that's uh, that's recording this video, um, she was my high school Spanish teacher too, um, Senora Butler. Um, she she was a leader too as well. She helped me, you know, realize uh, a whole lot of things. Um, so so that's why I, I feel like people have that misconceived notion that okay, you're a leader, whatever you say goes. No. I, I guess I can consider myself a leader um, in the classroom because I'm a teacher, but that doesn't mean that what I say goes. In my classroom, I like to have it, you know, teacher-student, um, you know, that good teacher-student relationship where I'm shifting away from the banking concept model, but I'm utilizing more of that uh, problem-posing education where uh, students and teachers work together, um, and, uh, and, uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing. So, um, you know, that's kind of the first thing that I thought about um, with this question. Um, number 14, response to the following. To do nothing, once informed, uh, is tantamous to the immoral position of conspirator. The immoral position is to commit oneself to end oppression. What is your first reaction to this quote? To what extent uh, do you demonstrate the willingness to facilitate this dialogue with others and reflect on the impact practices and policies have on improving schools for all children? Be specific. Um, you know, when I first read this quote, um, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was pedagogy of the oppressed, um, about how you know, in the beginning, you're oppressed, and then um, the oppressor oppresses the oppressed. Um, you know, us as teachers, we have to do our best to end oppression, especially in the schools. Um, and that's the first thing that I thought about. Um, by sitting there and doing nothing, you're not going to accomplish anything. You won't get anywhere. Um, so I extremely uh, believe this, that, uh, that you have to facilitate dialogue with others and reflect on, on each other's practices. Because by talking about it, by having comfortable conversations and conscious conversations, um, and uh, and doing and doing those things, um, you will make a difference. You will make a change, and you will include all all students, um, and, and you'll go from you know inequity to equity. Um, so, so yeah, um, you know, us as teachers, we want to try and you know end oppression, and uh, and that's basically what what my job now is to do, and that's kind of what I'm striving to do now. Um, so, uh, so with that being said, I guess that concludes uh, my self-reflective response. It's a lot tougher than I thought. Um, I want to say thank you for uh, Senora Butler for helping me out with this, and uh, yeah, I'll see you in class.